And one day it's kind of quiet. Uh, good afternoon. As you all know, the president will be speaking uh, this afternoon in Louisville, and we've got an event coming up, so I'll try to uh, keep this relatively short to focus on, uh, let the president focus on uh, his message for, for the day. Um, in regard to the news of the day, uh, this morning, after receiving his daily intelligence briefing, the president met with Bill Gates, the co-chair and trustee of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The president and Mr. Gates talked about their shared commitment to finding and stopping disease outbreaks around the world. Uh, the president particularly commented, commended uh, Mr. Gates for the Gates Foundation work in global health and health security. Generous and innovative private uh, philanthropic groups like the Gates Foundation are critical to our mission of finding the cures for tomorrow. Also this morning, the confirmation hearings in the Judiciary came, began, and Judiciary Committee began for the President's nominee for the Supreme Court, Judge Neil Gorsuch. As the judge will continue to show throughout his process, he's eminently qualified for this position with impeccable academic credentials, a brilliant legal mind, and a proven commitment to the Constitution. On Tuesday and Wednesday, Judge Gorsuch will be questioned by each member of the panel. And on Thursday, we anticipate uh, things to conclude with a panel of witnesses. Uh, the President was glad to see so many people convey their support in the last few days for Judge Gorsuch. Just this past weekend, Senator Grassley, former New York Mayor Bloomberg, editorial boards from across the country and several of his former colleagues and classmates either penned op-eds and editorials uh, or provided comments in one way or another stating his uh, impeccable qualifications for the bench. Uh, as they add to the long list of jurists, politicians, and elected officials from both sides of the aisle who have already given the judge their support. The President looks forward to watching Judge Gorsuch continue to show the Senate what an extraordinary addition he will be to the bench and he's confident that he will be confirmed. Uh, later in the morning, the President had a meeting with Speaker Ryan, Secretary of Health and Human Services, Dr. Tom Price, and Dr. Zeke Emanuel. Dr. Manuel has been intimately involved in crafting the healthcare have, crafting healthcare policy since his work on Obamacare. Obviously, he and pre the president have some differing views on the best way to make healthcare affordable and accessible, but the president also strongly believes that the health and well-being of the American people shouldn't always be a partisan issue, and he will continue to reach across party lines and listen to uh, voices on this issue. Last week, he heard from individuals and family who have suffered from the disastrous results of Obamacare. He's previously spoken to health care policy groups, Republican congressional leadership, and health insurance companies. This week, he and his staff will have discussions on women in health care while continuing an open dialogue with members of Congress. Uh, and he will, do, he will be uh, hosting even more meetings and listening sessions in the coming weeks as he works with Congress to bring common sense reforms to our health care system. The President has shown that he's willing to hear from all stakeholders in the health care field, and he will continue to listen as the process on the American Health Care Act moves along and we pursue the additional legislative and administrative actions necessary. This afternoon, the President had lunch with the Vice President, uh, and as we speak, he's meeting with Secretary of State Tillerson. The Secretary just returned from an important trip to Asia. He made it clear that America is committed to our allies, Japan and the Republic of Korea, and that we expect China to increase its role in persuading North Korea to move away from nuclear weapon and ballistic missile development and towards steps to create a better future for the North Korean people. This trip set the stage for future, future leader uh, level engagement between the U.S. and China. During this meeting, he will debrief the President on his trip. Later this afternoon, the President will welcome the Prime Minister, Prime Minister al Abadi of Iraq. The Iraqi people have been a brave and steadfast partner in our shared fight against ISIS, al-Qaeda, and radicalism. The President will speak with the Prime Minister about how that partnership will help defeat ISIS and move into a new era in which Iraq is a force for stability and peace in a prosperous Middle East. After his bilateral meeting with the Prime Minister, the President will depart the White House for Louisville, Kentucky for a Make America Great Again rally before returning to the White House later this evening. A few notes at the end before I take some questions. Yesterday, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin returned from a very successful trip to Europe where he stopped in the UK for a bilateral with the Chancellor of the Exchequer and later met with 18 of his counterparts during the G20 ministerial in Baden-Baden. This trip gave the Secretary an opportunity to outline the administration's priorities on a number of issues, including macroeconomic policy, financial regulation, international tax, and illicit finance. During the meetings, the Secretary and his counterparts presented a platform that will strengthen our collective work on steps to promote growth and financial stability. 
in terms of the schedule for the rest of the week. Tomorrow, the President will sign S-442, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration Transition Authorization Act of 2017 in the morning, and make remarks at the National Republican Congressional Committee March dinner in the evening. On Wednesday, as I mentioned last week, the President will meet with the Congressional Black Caucus. On Thursday, the President will hold an event with truck drivers and representatives from the trucking companies and industry on health care and its negative impacts on their industry and livelihood. Uh, which just happens to be the largest employer in 29 states. And on Friday, the President will hold a Greek Independence Day celebration. We'll have further uh, updates on all of those events later. Uh, and finally, I want to address the um, House Intelligence Committee hearing that is currently happening in which the FBI Director and the NSA Director are currently testifying and comment to the extent that I can at this time. This hearing, as Chairman Nunes noted, is the first of several that the House Intelligence Committee is engaged in. And the President is happy that they're pursuing the facts in this. As has been pri previously reported, Director Comey confirmed that the FBI is investigating Russia's role in interfering with the election. And let me just comment briefly on that. Following this testimony, it's clear that nothing has changed. Senior Obama intelligence officials have gone on record to confirm that there is no evidence of a Trump-Russia collusion. Uh, the Obama CIA director said so. Obama's director of national intelligence said so and we take them at their word. However, there was some new information that came from the hearing that we believe is newsworthy about the intelligence gathering process the un and the unmasking of Americans identified in intelligence reports and the illegal leak of such unmasked individuals, which is a federal crime. Director Comey told the House Intelligence Committee that certain political appointees in the Obama administration had access to the names of unmasked U.S. citizens such as senior White House officials, senior Department of Justice officials, and senior intelligence officials. Before President Obama left office, Michael Flynn was unmasked, and then illegally his identity was leaked out to media outlets, despite the fact that, as NSA Director Rogers said, that unmasking and revealing individuals endangers, quote, national security. Not only was, uh, was General Flynn uh, his identity made available, Director Comey refused to answer the question of whether or not he had actually briefed President Obama on, this, on his uh, phone calls and activities. Director Comey called these types of disclosures of classified information a threat to national security and said he will investigate and pursue these matters to the full extent of law. He also said that the leaking of classified information had become, quote, unusually active in the time frame in question. It's also important to note that both Directors Comey and Rogers told the committee that they have no evidence that votes were changed in the swing states the President had won. Uh, I don't – I think that that pretty much until we get the, uh, the ending of this hearing, uh, I don't know that I want to comment too much further. Uh, and with that, I'm glad to take a few questions. Sean. Jonathan. Um, Sean, does the President still have complete confidence in FBI Director Comey? Uh, there's no reason to believe he doesn't at this time. John. He said – wait, I was, I was, he, 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 he said that uh, – there is no information to support the allegations that the President made against President Obama. At this time. So is the President prepared to withdraw that accusation and apologize to the President? No, we're, 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 we started a hearing. Um, it's still ongoing. And then, as Dr uh, Chairman Nunez mentioned, this is one in a series of hearings uh, that will be happening. I think there's – as I noted last week, it's, it's – there's also a lot of interesting news coming out of that in terms of the activities that have gone on to reveal the information on American citizens that have been part of this, particularly General Flynn. Um, there's a lot of things that aren't being covered in in this hearing that I think are interesting. Um, that that you know, since it's ongoing, I'll, I'll leave that for now. But I think there's a lot of uh, areas that still need to be covered. There's a lot of information that still needs to be discussed. The director also said he's investigating the links and the possibility of coordination between the Trump campaign and the Russians. Given that the President just this morning said that the Democrats made up the Russia story, why would the FBI director be investigating a story if it's simply I, I don't think that's something. what he said, but again, look at what no, no, he, hold on. He, did. he said that he's investigating the nature of any links between right. individuals associated with the Trump campaign and the Russian government and whether or not there was any coordination. Correct. But again, investigating it and having proof of it are two different things. You look at the acting Obama CIA director said that there is smoke but there is no fire, Senator Tom Cotton. Not that I'm seen and not that I'm aware of. Um, you look at Director Clapper, not to my knowledge. Senator Chris Coons, Democrat from Delaware, I have no evidence of collusion. I mean, there's a point at which you continue to search for something that everybody who's been briefed hasn't seen or found. Um, I think it's fine to look into it.
But at the end of the day, they're going to come to the same conclusion that everybody else has had. So you can conti continue to look for something, but continuing to look for something that doesn't exist doesn't matter. There is a discussion, I heard some names thrown around before, uh, that, that were hangers on or on the campaign. And I think at some point, people that you know, got thrown around at the beginning of this hearing, uh, some of those names, the greatest amount of interaction that they've had is had cease and desist letters sent to them. So you know about the Roger Stones and the Carter no, no, Pages. No, yeah, no, exactly. The Carter Pages, yes. But I mean, those people, the greatest amount of interaction that they had with the campaign was the campaign apparently sending them a series of cease and desist letters. Uh, so again, I think that when you read a lot of this activity about associates, uh, there is a fine line between people who want to be part of something that they never had an official role in and people who actually played a role in either the campaign or the transition. Julie. I just have two quick questions on the hearing today. Does the president, now that we know that there is an ongoing investigation by the FBI, does the president stand by his comments that he's not aware of any contacts that his campaign associates had with Russia during the election? Uh, yes. Okay. And then the second one is, has anyone from the White House... Well, can I just amend the first? Sure. Obviously, I just, with, just to be clear, I know that I'm trying to think through this for a second because obviously um, General Flynn... Right. But again, I... I gen the campaign, right. And, before and, the election. And, and, and I'm not aware of any at this time, but even General Flynn was, was a volunteer of the campaign. Um, and then obviously there's been this discussion of, of Paul Manafort, who played a very limited role for a very limited amount of time. But beyond, but are you the chairman hey, the John, Jonathan, hold on. Can you, can you stop interrupting other people's well, questions? Okay, hey, Jonathan, role. somebody's asking a question. It's not your press briefing. Julie's asking a question. Please calm down. Just Julie. Are you saying then that the president is aware of contacts that Manafort No, no, had nothing that hasn't been previously discussed. Okay. I just don't want to make it look like we're not aware of, of the stuff Understood. that's been. And then the second thing, has anyone from the White House up to the President been interviewed by the FBI as part of this investigation? Not that I'm aware of. Mara. Um, you said that you, you made a point of saying that uh, Comey refused to say whether he had briefed Obama um, about uh, the investigation and also the President on his official account tweeted the same thing today. <coughs> um, Comey made a point today of saying please do not draw any conclusions from my ability to confirm or deny anything, but you are drawing a conclusion well, from that. We're, so I think we're, we're pointing drawing? it out. I mean, we're making a point that uh, that it, it is not known. And I think there's further, I mean, to, to everyone who was looking for a conclusion today, I think there's a lot more that needs to be discussed and, and uh, looked at before we can jump to a conclusion about, hold on. But I, I think the point is, is that in the same token, you've got individuals that want an answer. And at the same time, there's clearly a lot of information that still hasn't come out or been discussed. So, so you're looking forward to, the, to this investigation? I, I think that we are, there is a lot more to come, is the but, answer that the I... The reason that I'm asking this question is you said that they are going to come to the same conclusion of everybody else. My point is, is that... So you already know what the conclusion is. No, no, no. What, I, what I'm getting at is that there is this continuous, there is this media narrative that continues to talk about collusion that exists, and yet every person that's been briefed, Nunez, Tom Cotton, Chris Coons, de Democrat of, of, of Delaware, Clapper, the Obama appointee, have all said that nothing that they've seen makes them believe that there was any collusion. And I think there's a difference between talking about an investigation into the 2016 election, which we all know, and any evidence of con collusion. There is no evidence, according to the people that have been briefed, of any collusion or activity that, that leads them to believe that 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 exists. I think that is an important point that gets overlooked over and over and over I think again. It's fine to look into it, but they are going to come to the same conclusion of everybody else that this collusion doesn't exist. So you you already know. No, I don't. What, what, what I'm, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is is that every single person, because what what the director said today is that there's an ongoing investigation. My point is to say that everybody who's been briefed on that investigation, it's it doesn't. There's an assumption that because of an investigation, it must mean that it's it's about something. My point to you is is that there's an assumption on behalf of most people in the media about what that investigation must mean. And my point to you is is that despite the the narrative that gets played over and over again with respect to what the investigation might mean in terms of collusion, every person, Republican and Democrat, that's been briefed on it has come to the same conclusion that there is no collusion and that that's over. So while we can talk about an investigation big picture holistically, the idea that so many people are trying to jump to a conclusion seems very, very misguided. Zeke. Two quick ones. First, um, just off the Tillerson briefing uh, uh, with the President, 
will do you expect the invitation to President Xi for that summit that they report on for next month to be, was that extended on that trip? Do you expect that to be taking place early April 5th, the 6th, 7th? I'll try to have more of a readout afterwards. I know that they're going to talk extensively about what he accomplished in both, you know, uh, Japan, South Korea, uh, and, and obviously in Beijing. But I'm, I'm going to let uh, the Secretary of State debrief the President before I get ahead of deciding what they, what, what was discussed in Beijing. Back to the previous topic, I was hoping we can spread the circle a little bit. Um, you said in the case of the president's tweets that um, there's an ongoing investigation, um, that you know more 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 things will come out that may may justify that. But in the case of the collusion charge, you listed all the people who said there's right. no investigation there. Why, in one case, is that sufficient to say that you know there is no you can rule out collusion now versus in the other case you say oh there's going to be more information coming out that will prove well, I'm these not, tweets because, that because, have, because again I, I think there's a difference. I'm not ruling anything out. I'm merely explaining to you that every person. Republican, Democrat, Obama, that, that served in the Obama administration across a broad section. In terms of what? That there's, that there are. But, but, but I think that there's, on the, on the investigation itself, we know from the people who have been briefed, on the other piece of it, we know that there's, it's an ongoing thing and that the, even according to the Department of Justice, uh, in terms of the information that's been provided in Chairman Nunez, that they are still at the beginning of this process. That is a very different thing than a group of people saying there is an ongoing investigation, and from what we've been briefed, there is no evidence to suggest any type of conclusion. That, that's a difference. Hunter. Thanks, John. On a slightly different topic, um, in his first eight weeks in office, President Trump has made at least 10 trips to the golf course. Um, he regularly used to criticize President Obama for spending time on the course. How is his golf game any different? Well, I think two things. One is you saw him utilize this as an opportunity with Prime Minister Abe um, to, uh, to help for foster deeper relationships in Southeast Asia, uh, in Asia rather, and have, have a, a growing relationship that's going to help U.S. interests. How you use the game of golf is, is something that he's talked about. Secondly, you know, we went to, um, down to, he had a, a mini cabinet meeting the other day down, or two weekends ago, uh, down at his his uh, club in Virginia, and I remember so many people jumping to the conclusion that he was going down and playing with playing golf. Just because you go somewhere doesn't necessarily mean that you did it. So on a couple occasions, he's actually conducted meetings there. He's actually had phone calls. Um, so just because he heads there doesn't mean that, that that's what's happening. So let's. I know, I know he did meet with um, Prime Minister Abe on the course, but um, we're not getting a lot of details on other high-level meetings that are taking place. If he is having these productive meetings on the course, why isn't the president and his aides being a little more forthcoming about what he's doing? I, it's the same reason that he can have dinner or lunch with somebody and not because I think the president's entitled to a bit of privacy at some point, where we bring that, which is what we've always agreed to. We bring the press, pool, the protective pool, uh, to be there, but the president's, you know, also entitled to a bit of, of privacy as well. Try. Uh, does the, pre the president believe the FBI will do a fair job of investigating any sort of links to Russia during the election? And then I have one more for you. I think there's a variety of, of institutions looking at it, both the House and the Senate Intel Intelligence Committee, the FBI. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that when you get to the bottom of it, it's, uh, we'll have a much better picture of what's happening, and I think it'll continue to vindicate him on that. Go ahead. In the follow-up, uh, the president tweeted this morning a question about a potential DNC connection to Russia during the election. Right. <coughs> Is he under the impression that the Clinton campaign had inappropriate contact with Russia during the election? Well, I think that there's an, and that's an interesting aspect of all of this that's not being covered. Number one, uh, from everything that has been publicly available, on several occasions, the DNC was asked by the FBI to investigate or to allow their servers to be looked at, despite all of the claims of their concerns about leaking. And yet the question still doesn't come out, what, why wouldn't the DNC on multiple occasions rebuff the FBI? What, what, why were they not wanting, if they were so concerned about hacks and leaking, why did the DNC not ask the FBI to come look? What, not only did they not ask them, they rebuffed them on multiple occasions. Why? What, was, what, are they, what are they hiding? What were they concerned of? But I think there's a serious question. I mean, it's not, it's, it, they, they're very clear about the concerns that they have, and as well as all of the, the leadership in the Democratic Party. And yet, when it came to hacks and leaks out of the DNC, uh, and they, they're quick to jump to the conclusion about who did it, and yet they wouldn't allow the FBI to investigate it. There's a whole second set of uh, concerns here in terms of what was Hillary Clinton's role. I mean, you look at the Obama history, or the Obama administration, and the Clinton, uh, the Clinton's involvement with Russia in terms of donations that that. 
the Clintons received from, from Russian entities. The idea that they sold off a tremendous amount of the, the, the uranium to, to the Russian government. And yet, wh where was the concern for that? What are we doing to look into that? It was the Obama administration in 2009 that talked about a reset uh, with Russia and a desire to, to reset relationships. Um, it was Hillary Clinton who signed off on the deal that gave a Russian company one-fifth of the U.S. uranium supply. Where is the questioning about that? What did they get? There was discussion the other day about uh, a Russian official noting that both campaigns, they sought to do it. Where is the concern about their efforts on the Hillary Clinton thing? The Democrats and the Democratic Party and a lot of those individuals are quick to point fingers, and yet when it comes to discussing their own collusion or questions involving their, their uh, involvement with Russian officials or or buyoffs to the Russians, there's no discussion there. So you've got to wonder on, on both sides where's where's the parity when it comes to these kind of investigations, Margaret. John, what about the president on this front when you say there's more to come for? You've got the FD, FBI director saying nothing back up. The president's tweets about wiretapping. Former head of the DNI, House Intelligence Committee. I mean, we've had a series of officials. So when does this end for the president? Is well, it March 28th? Yeah, I, it's not a question of a date. It's a question of where we get answers. You look at someone like Michael Flynn, and you ask the question, how does an American citizen who should be protected by law from having their identity unmasked how does, how does that happen? Because you got to think about it just like this. The FBI and all of the relevant intelligence agencies have access to this document. They can figure out who it was, right? Sorry. Hold on. So, so who, who it was? hold on. In other words, they- The wiretapping of the president. That, no, no, that's uh, the listen, I, I understand that. What I'm getting at is that there's a lot of information that we have come to learn about what happened in terms of surveillance throughout the 2016 election and the transition. And when you look at somebody like Michael Flynn and you realize that while they might have been looking at somebody else at that time, how does somebody's name that's protected by law from being disclosed get, 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 get put out in the public? Why was it put out in the public? Because the people in the intelligence community would have had access to that information. They could have found out who it was. But yet, you've got to question, why was a name that should have been protected by law from being put out into the public domain put out there? What were the motives behind that? What else do we need to know? Who was behind that kind of uh, unmasking? So are you saying the president has evidence that we have No, no, I, I am saying that there's a lot more questions that need to get asked about the involved, what was being done in terms of surveillance, who was being surveilled, why were they being surveilled, what techniques, uh, what, why are certain people being sort of, quote, unmasked and, and having their identity known? What was going on? But there's a lot more questions than answers that need to who, get asked. Who does the president trust to provide those and, and answers I think we, we've if talked not about, the heads of all those agencies? And, 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 it, and we've talked about this ad nauseum, that the House and the Senate Intelligence Committees are looking into this. Today is the first of several hearings that, that – uh, Chairman Nunez intends to call. Senator Burr has already talked about it. There is a ways to go, and I get that you guys want to know the end of the book right now, but we're on the first chapter of this process. Steve. So Burr and Nunez, he does trust that. Of course. So we've we've put out a statement saying so much that we asked them to look into it. So I, I don't think it should come into any surprise that that's where we have noted multiple times that that's where the president believes the appropriate place in the process and the class of, and, and for, for all of these documents to go through. Steve. The president said he had a lot of meetings over the weekend on North Korea. Who were those meetings with, and what was his reaction to North Korea's test of this new rocket engine? Well, I, I think we continue to be concerned um, with North Korea's activity. That's why um, not only have we uh, continued to have conversations with officials in Japan and South Korea, but continue to, to urge China to step in and to play a larger role in deterring um, both the ballistic and other missile threats that, that, um, that North Korea plays. I, I'm not, I will have, try to have a further readout on some of those conversations, but I think there is growing concern about, uh, about North Korea. I think that is part of what Secretary Tillerson is going to be discussing with him during their meeting. And did Tillerson get the promise from China to weigh in more on North Korea? I think he sent a very clear signal that our policy of strategic patience is over. The President and the Secretary of State have uh, an expectation that China uh, employ multiple points of pressure on North Korea. Um, we, do, we know that we don't agree 100 percent of the time with China, but as the State Department noted yesterday, both President Xi and Secretary Tillerson agreed that there are, are opportunities uh, for greater cooperation between China and the United States and acknowledge that there are and will be in the future differences between the two countries. But I think that Secretary Tillerson's trip continued to 
or help set us down that path. And I think that the follow-on meetings that the leaders intend, intend to have uh, will be helpful in, in, that, in that vein. Um, given the talk last week about the budget, the priorities for the American tax dollars, the need to cut programs like, you know, or make cuts to programs like Meals of Wheels in the Art, is the President going to consider curving some of his trips to Mar-a-Lago, which the GAO estimates could cost $3 million for a trip for the President to Palm Beach? Is he planning to cut those back at all, given his feelings about the priorities for the Americans' tax dollars? I, I think that is a vast reach to suggest. I mean, the, the presidents, presidents always travel. And I think the President, wherever he goes, uh, he carries the apparatus of the White House with us. That is just something that happens. Uh, the President will continue to go uh, and travel around the country and, uh, and have meetings to solve the nation's problems. And again, I think just with, because I know you took a little bit of a shot there, I think even the Washington Post, which is no friend to, to, to conservatives, uh, even they sided with us that these false sort of um, narratives on Meals on Wheels, it's not a federal program. Three percent of their total budget comes from from the from a block grant that's passed through there. It's a state-run program. They had a, apparently a phenomenal weekend this week. I, I get that that's a cute program to point at, but it is false and misleading to us to try to make that, that narrative stick. Yeah, when, so I know to your point that all presidents travel. No president has traveled so often and so early to their own private residence. But so President Bush went to Crawford. I mean, there are places. Often I, I, I get it. I get it. But but at the same time, uh, the president's very clearly that he's worked seven days a week. This is where uh, he goes to see his family. Uh, he brings people down there. This is part of, of being president. John. Thank you, Sean. Uh, turning back to the meeting with Chancellor Merkel on Friday, did the president and the chancellor discuss the economic crisis in Greece at all? And given the appointment of two officials to the Treasury Department who have been critical of the International Monetary Fund, does the administration see a new or different role for the IMF in resolving the Greek economic crisis? Uh, let me refer you to the Treasury Department on IMF. I think the readout that we provided uh, on the Secretary's, on the, on the Chancellor's visit, rather, excuse me. Um, speaks for itself. They spoke at length as far as what they discussed and, and what they meant. So I'm not going to step on that. Francesca. Uh, thank you. Are you aware of any White House officials that are under investigation by the FBI? No. Okay. And you mentioned the hangers on in the campaign earlier and Carter Page, but there was also a question about Roger Stone. Was he also in that category? Is he someone that the president is still in frequent contact with? Because he's often called an informal advisor to the president right. and a confidant of him. Um, Mr. Stone is somebody the president has known for a long time. Um, they, he worked briefly on the campaign, I think, till about August of 2015, uh, from from recollection. Um, but they 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 have talked from time to time, but I don't think any time recently. Uh, but they had a long relationship uh, going back years, where they would provide counsel. And again, I played a, a role early on in his campaign, but ended that role in August of 2015, and, and I don't know at all when the last time I even spoke was. Uh, Sean, uh, did the, um, in the meeting this morning with uh, Gates, did the, um, the President's cut in NIH funding come up, and how does he square meeting with Gates and, and sort of focusing on this whole need to continue medical research and then at the same time want to cut uh, medical research funding by such a large amount? I, I mean, I know they talked about cures and health, and I think uh, he applauds a lot of the work that they've done overseas in particular. Um, I don't have a, a full read on that yet, but I'll, I'll try to get you more on it. Th there's, but look, we, we've discussed the NIH in particular. I think that there's this assumption in Washington that if you don't spend more on a subject that you're not caring as much. When you look at some of the um, agencies and departments and programs that we've seen, uh, in many cases they're not meeting their mission. And I think there are cost savings that can be achieved and so that you can focus the dollars that are being allocated towards a more effective use of, um, of the mission at, at hand. But, you know, it's interesting. I mean, only in Washington do you literally judge the success of something by how much money you throw at the problem, not actually whether it's solving the problem or coming up with anything. Sean. April. Sean, um, I want to go to a couple of topics. One, back on wiretapping, um, Comey said he had no information supporting that President Obama wiretapped President Trump. So with that, um, you have uh, Rep. 
shift saying things like there are half truths coming from this president, no truths, it's dangerous, uh, we are alienating uh, our allies, uh, we need to be able to trust our president. And with that, I'm going to ask you, and I need an answer for this, how do you gain trust as some view him as the boy who cried wolf? I, I think if you're citing Adam Schiff's political diatribe at the beginning as some sort of sense of, I mean, he, he literally went off. You want to talk about, hold on, hold on. You want to talk about a series of mistruths and, and misdirection. I think if you look at that, that opening statement, it was filled with those. So I don't need to use that as some basis for having to respond to. It was, you know, I was watching a lot of the reporter response on Twitter uh, initially to, to his his sort of diatribe, and I think there were several folks that, that talked about how he's mischaracterizing and, and taking things way out of context. So to use that as the basis of some kind of authoritative, uh, it, saying there is no information. I, I think and at this point, and again, I think <laughs> April, I've addressed this multiple times. At this point, there is we, we are at the beginning phases of this, and we have ways to go. John, but I'm not just I have specific on the budget. Yeah, okay, on the budget. Um, how and this is kind of going back. This is to number the, three now. Not really. It's <laughs> number two. Thank you. Um, how is the president contributing to his own goal of reducing spending, the deficit and the debt, in his management of spending here at the White House? Well, there's a lot. I mean, we've used um, the, the White House when it looks at a total percentage of the budget is minuscule. I think that you, to, to ask that question is somewhat ironic after seeing Director Mulvaney sit up here the other day and talk about uh, the savings and the cost-cutting measures that we've seen across the entire budget. Uh, he sat up here and got grilled on that. Uh, and answered effectively how the president is looking at efficiencies and duplicity in all programs throughout government. Um, so it's not just a question of, of here at the White House, but he's looking at it holistically throughout all of government. But then you look at some of the activities the president's personally engaged at in terms of uh, the F-35, the next generation of, the, uh, uh, of Air Force One, personally getting in, in, in looking at ways in which we can create a more effective and efficient procurement process. That's one area where I think you're going to see the president personally engage on more and more, is looking at all the stuff that the government buys and how we're doing it, our bidding process in so many ways, especially in the Department of Defense. What about salaries? We know three people here are not taking salaries. Right. But what about salaries? I'm talking about since he's making these massive cuts, right. is the hurt going to come here as well? Sure. I mean, it's not just a hurt, but you bring it up. There are multiple people here uh, who are not taking salaries. I mean, that is, huh? No, way more than three, April. How many? How many? I'll get back to you, but there's several of uh, individuals that are not taking a salary here. Um, so when you talk about commitment to helping to come serve this government, serve the president, and actually um, help institute a vision, there's a lot of people who have sacrificed tremendously in terms of saying, I'll give up. You know, I've done very well for myself. I, I've This country's benefited me. This is an opportunity for me to give back. That there are people um, well through this organization who have done that. John. Um, the president met with Dr. Emanuel, you pointed out, a short time ago. He's probably one of the fiercest critics That's of right. what the president is trying to do. If anybody out there, he's made it quite clear that he believes that this will take us back to worse than we were before the Affordable Care Act came in. What did the president hope to gain by meeting with Dr. Emanuel? Well, he's an architect of Obamacare. Um, I think that despite our political and policy differences, um, you know, he wants to hear ideas not just of him, but a lot of people. And that's, I mean, we've brought in people on both sides of the aisle, from both houses, from, in, from industry. The idea is to try to make this the best possible. Um, he talked to Elijah Cummings a couple weeks ago about drug prices. It's not about ideology or party. It's about instituting a patient-centered patient -centric drug uh, and health care system that benefits the American people and gives them the access and the price point that they can get health care and actually get coverage. So it is, it is hearing his ideas, it's listening to his suggestions and figuring out if we can make it better. Part of the manager's amendment that Speaker Ryan talked about uh, is in large part because we've been listening and making it better and making it better. And as it continues to work its will through the process, it's not just the current bill, but it's also the additional legislation that's part of this overall three-pronged process that we've talked about. So making sure that we do this right and we give the American people the best possible outcome is what this has always been about. The speaker wants to get this in front of the House maybe by Thursday. How much will the plan change between now and then compared to what we saw voted on in the, in the first two committees? And is the president going three. up to the Hill one, tomorrow? Two, three. 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 Ways and means I, 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 uh, and is the president going up to the Hill tomorrow morning? 
Uh, well, uh, we don't have any announcements on the schedule at this time. Um, he's going to continue to make sure that we do everything we can, and I'll leave the legislative piece up to Speaker but, Ryan. But how much does he think it's Chairman going Sessions. to change between what we saw voted on by Ways and Means? And it Energy depends and on how much. I, look, it, it, I think Speaker Ryan detailed some um, some additions and ideas and suggestions on on your network yesterday with Chris Wallace. Uh, that he is considering, and I think as we continue to meet with folks, he there's some staff level discussions that occurred over the weekend. There'll be more later this afternoon, and to the extent that we can make changes that I think enable us to maintain um, 218 votes, we will do it. Sarah, thanks, John. Um, there are a number of the president's supporters on the Hill and elsewhere who worry that the president's refusal to drop the whole wiretapping issue will eclipse some of his other accomplishments. What message? does the president have for his supporters who worry that this could be a rabbit hole that might diminish the other things he's trying to do, like health care? I think there will be a lot of accomplishments, so they don't need to worry. We've got a lot of things coming down the pike, and I think whether it's health care, tax reform, his infrastructure plan, reforming government, immigration, I mean, I, uh, I think we're going to have a lot of things to be very proud of that uh, people on both sides of the aisle are, are going to be excited to see enacted, and, um, and so in due time, there'll be plenty to be proud of. Sarah. Uh, you this an incidental figure in this campaign, but he worked for the campaign for five months. He was the campaign chairman. He was there for a number of pivotal decisions. So I'm wondering how is that insignificant, and is the White House aware of any contacts between Paul Manafort and Russian operatives or suspected Russian op operatives, and is that a cause for concern? Well, just so we're clear, I'm not dismissing Paul Manafort as a hanger on. I was noting some other folks, as Jonathan pointed out. Uh, with respect to Paul, though, I believe, and again, I'm not looking to relitigate the election, or, uh, but I believe Paul was brought on sometime in June, and by the middle of August, he was he was no longer with the campaign. Meaning that for the entire final stretch of the general election, he was not involved. And so, to start to to look at some individual that was there for a short period of time or separately individuals who really didn't play any role in the campaign and to suggest that those are the basis for anything is a bit ridiculous. So are you saying it wouldn't be cause for concern if we found out that Paul Manafort was in contact with Russian operatives or suspected? No, no, no. I, I think that, but to, but to intimate, chairman. right, no, no, but to intimate that somebody was there for eight weeks and definitely not there in the final three months of the campaign played some kind of lasting role that influenced you know, again, again, you, you realize I think somewhere between March, I mean, um, August 12th or the 15th was, was when he ended his affiliation with the campaign. So my point is to suggest now that if you look at the final three months of the campaign where none of the individuals in question that Democrats brought up over and over again today were affiliated with the campaign, to suggest that that somehow shows some high-level collusion. Uh, is a bit of a stretch, to say the least. And is the White House aware of any contacts between Paul Manafort and Russian operatives or suspected Russian operatives? No. Yeah. Join in more. Uh, Sean, you, you've been really critical of reports that are based on sources in the past. Today, it seems like the headline, the two headlines that we got out of the committee were, one, a, an official confirmation directly from the FBI and the Justice Department that there is an ongoing criminal investigation into a, whether associates of the sitting president had contacts with Russia, Russia and Russian operatives and whether there was any coordination between those. And the second headline being that there is an official, you had questioned in the past, previously a couple weeks ago, when there were reports in our paper and others that the FBI director was indicating that there was no support for the president's tweets. You said, well, those are just reports. Those are not coming from his mouth. He hasn't said it. Okay, we've now got it from his mouth directly in open testimony that there's no evidence that he has to support the president's tweets. I guess the question is, you know, does that, does, do those two facts, which are now on the record and not attributed to anonymous sourcing, does that cause this White House any concern? And how, and how come you treat the one, the latter, the one about wiretapping, you want to say that's just in the early stages, but on the former one, you want to sort of come to the conclusion that that the investigation has sort of gotten to the point where you you, know, you don't have to worry about that because that's that's all said and done and everybody's come to the conclusion on that. So that seems like you're treating both of those pieces of news very differently. Well, first, I think your headlines are bad. Uh, I'm glad to rewrite. I don't like that. I, 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 I'd be glad to if you like if you guys are looking for some help. Uh, I, I'm, I'm for a job. <laughs> I, I, I would. I just. Our services are at the New York Times' disposal if it comes to writing headlines, and we could probably do a couple things on stories too. If you're, 
if you're, if you're willing to go there. Um, I, I think because there's a big difference. Um, one, one is literally talking. There's a big difference. Everyone keeps conflating that there's a, an investigation into the 2016 election. Got it. No disagreement there, right? But I think that there's a question about collusion between anybody. And my point has been to say over and over again to the dismay of every one of you guys is that when the people who have been briefed by the FBI about collusion between individuals, the answer is continues to be no. And at some point, take no for an answer. When these people, both sides of the aisle, Obama appointees, elected Democrats, elected Republicans, say no evidence suggested, at some point, it's not just about me, it's about you. Take no for an answer and realize that the people, while you can have an investigation, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to jump to the conclusion that, aha, it must be about the collusion between those two things. They've talked about this for a long time, the 17 intelligence agencies have talked about an ongoing investigation into Russia's involvement in the election. That's vastly different than jumping to the conclusion and saying that there must be somehow, therefore, a, conclu a collusion between individuals on one side. They don't talk about all of the Hillary Clinton collusion that may or may not have occurred, and that was a subject that came up with a Russian official, and yet that has not gotten pursued once. There were zero minutes paid on the evening news the other night when that Russian official said that they attempted to reach out to both campaigns. Zero minutes. I know, I know. See, I, I'm an equal opportunity whack. But can I just say, to, does, does the but, president but, need to take no for an answer in the same way that you're urging? No, because the one is, to one is a bunch of people who have been briefed who are saying we haven't seen anything, and one is an ongoing. And because if you again, when you ask them, they are getting it. The president was very clear, and I think there's continuing to be a, a very, very literal interpretation of his tweet, which is whether or not there was wiretapping. The president understands that you don't literally wiretap people the same way that you did in the 70s and 80s with wires and, and things in the top of phone. So, right. Director but, Comey didn't, didn't, I, didn't no, focus on no, wiretapping. He, 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 you but know, again, I think that we are, at, we are still at the beginning phase of a look as to what kind of surveillance occurred and why, and that there's a question about what leaks occurred why they're happening. And again, you know, just Director Comey's, because I, I believe one of the big headlines that should come out of today is that when he talks about the unusually high amount of leaks that are coming out of this and classified information leak, that in itself should be a question. Why is so much information being leaked out now? What, what are the motives behind it? Who is doing it? And is it threatening our national security? Which I do believe the answer is yes. But there is a lot of other stories. It, and, and that's why I think with all due respect to your two headlines coming out, I do believe there's a lot of headlines coming out. It's just that the only headlines that people want to write are the ones that support a narrative against this administration and not one that actually looks into, you know, how many times do people say that there was no evidence of something happening? How many times or how much classified information is being leaked? Um, there's a lot of headlines that should be written today about a lot of the stuff that's ongoing. And I know that we have an ongoing hearing, but there's a lot of other things that need to get discussed and aren't being happening. Why did the DNC not let the FBI look at their servers? Why has that not story not getting in? Because I would assume that if somebody was victim of something, which they have yelled from the rooftops. And, and hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. I'm sorry. I just be, I'm curious. The implication of that is is, is no, no. What? The question is why is none no, of that being looked at? Question, but I don't know what the but. You, you, but my point is is that not to, to draw an implication, but to merely ask a question. Which all I'm getting at is that the, suddenly none of the questions regarding any of this seem to get asked or answered or explored, and yet you won. You're on, here, I, Brian. You get the same treatment that <laughs> Jonathan does. That doesn't mean you get to jump in. So the answer that I'm getting at is, why, why are none of those questions being asked? Why is no one taking no for an answer when it comes to all of these individuals saying that they've seen nothing? But there are a series of headlines that I would suggest need to get written in, frankly, stories. I'm glad to do that as I offered. George. Uh, I'd like to try to clarify uh, two things. In the future, when, when you from that uh, podium read uh, from news articles or cite news articles, can we assume that you're vouching for the accuracy of those articles? I, I think merely reading a story that's in a paper is not vouching for it, it's reading the story. It doesn't put a White Do House in front No, I, I think reading a series of things when asked a question, where where is this narrative coming from, and citing a multitude of stories that are in the, in the public domain is not necessarily endorsing everything. I read, that, that's a, a silly, you know, 
assertion. We're reading stories that you and your colleagues, and not necessarily you, at National Journal, have put out, but there are several people in here whose publications have put something out. Simply recitating those things is not an endorsement. Second. The second thing is, can you, when you talk to the British about the uh, GCHQ thing, did you tell them that uh, the White House would not raise that again, or can you talk about that conversation? Um, there was a merely an explanation of what we did and, and why we did it, which is what I just said to you, and that was it. Simply that. Thank you guys for that. We'll see you tomorrow. Uh, hopefully some of you get a chance to go down today. If you don't, we'll, we'll have a readout. Thank you.